Most of our nightly dreams are either traumatic conga lines of unresolved anxiety or a hodgepodge of random incoherent nonsense that makes perfect sense while we're asleep but quickly fades into irrelevance once we wake up. But for some people, dreams can be far more useful. Indeed, they can change the world. Such was the case for German chemist August Kukula, who in 1861 dozed off in front of his fireplace and awoke with the solution to a difficult theoretical problem. This is the story of how a dream changed chemistry forever. Friedrich August Kakula was born on September the 7th, 1829, in Darmstadt, Hesse, the son of a civil servant, Ludwig Kakula. As a child, he excelled at languages, drawing, and science, and was originally intended by his family to become an architect. However, while studying at the University of Giessen in 1848, he was, in his words, seduced by a lecture from the great chemist Justus von Liebig and decided to change careers. In 1850, he began working in von Liebig's laboratory, where he studied the composition of gluten and wheat bran before graduating with a doctorate in chemistry in 1852. But as no teaching positions were then available, he continued his postdoctoral work in Paris, London, and Chur in Switzerland. It was while working in London under chemist John Stenhouse that Kukula first encountered the emerging field in which he would eventually make his name, organic chemistry. For centuries, scientists believed that organic substances produced by living organisms were fundamentally different from regular inorganic substances, being imbued with some kind of intangible life force. This doctrine was known as vitalism. In the early 19th century, however, this view began to crumble as chemists demonstrated that supposedly organic molecules could be synthesized from inorganic ones in the laboratory. For example, in 1828, German chemist Friedrich Waller heated ammonium cyanate, a supposedly inorganic molecule, to produce urea. In a letter to a fellow chemist, Jacob Berzelius, Waller boasted that, in a manner of speaking, I can no longer hold my chemical water. I must tell you that I can make urea without the use of kidneys of any animal, be it man or dog. Chemists eventually realized that organic substances obeyed the same chemical rules as inorganic ones, but all had one thing in common. They were based on carbon, the fundamental building block of life on Earth. Soon after this discovery, the newly established field of organic chemistry began taking the world by storm. The emerging illumination gas industry produced as a byproduct large quantities of a dark, sticky substance called coal tar, which chemists began probing in search of useful organic compounds. They were not disappointed. In 1856, British chemist William Perkin used coal tar to create the world's first synthetic dye, morphine, which not only revolutionized fashion, but also laid the groundwork for the modern global chemical industry. Just before we get into today's video, I do want to tell you that this video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one website building platform for entrepreneurs from beginners to seasoned pros. No matter how busy you are, Squarespace makes it easy to create a stunning website, connect with your audience, and even sell your products or services all under your control. Now, let me share some features about Squarespace that I love. First of all, Fluid Engine, it's like a magic wand for website design. I'm no tech whiz, I'm definitely no design whiz, but with Squarespace's drag and drop magic, you can turn a basic idea into a polished site in no time. There's also Squarespace extensions. These connect your website to third party tools, which means your website functionality is essentially limitless. No more, I wish my website could do this. That'd be cool. No, it can with Squarespace extensions. And Squarespace also have courses now you can create and sell an online online course, professional layout, custom videos, and thanks to Fluid Engine, it looks amazing. And here's the best part, a one-time fee or a subscription, it's up to you. Share your knowledge, make it work for you with Squarespace courses. So are you ready to create your own online presence? Head to squarespace.com slash brainfood for a free trial. And when you're ready to go big, use the promo code brainfood to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring. And now let's get into today's video. Research into coal tar and other hydrocarbons soon yielded a veritable cornucopia of revolutionary products, from medicines to cosmetics, paints, and lubricants. However, most of these early discoveries were made by blind trial and error, for chemists still did not fully understand how atoms came together to form molecules. In the early 19th century, chemists like Sir Humphrey Davy had used electricity to split chemical compounds into their constituent elements, allowing their chemical formulae, that is, the number of each element within a given molecule, to be determined. Based on these experiments, Davy concluded that chemical compounds were composed of atoms of opposite charges held together by electrostatic attraction. However, while this explanation worked well for simple compounds like sodium chloride, aka table salt, it did not explain the vast number of substances composed of atoms with the same electric charge. 
Indeed, in many compounds, an electrostatically positive atom, like hydrogen, could be replaced by an electrostatically negative one, like chlorine, with little change to the compound's physical or chemical properties. Another mystery was how two or more compounds could have such different properties while being composed of the same elements. For instance, the compounds propadine, propene, and cyclopropene all have the same chemical formula, C3H4. In 1856, Kakula was hired as an unsalaried lecturer at the University of Heidelberg, where he quickly distinguished himself as an energetic and highly original thinker and much-respected teacher. In 1858, he moved to the University of Ghent in Belgium, and again in 1867 to the University of Bonn in Germany, where he would remain for the rest of his career. It was while at the University of Ghent that Kakula made most of his major contributions to chemistry. Building on the observations of other chemists, Kakula recognized that different atoms had different capacities to combine with other atoms, what Berzelius called atomicity, but Kakula dubbed valens, or valency, the term still used to this day. For example, hydrogen can only bond with one other atom and thus has a valence of one. Sulfur has a valence of two, nitrogen three, carbon four, and so on. Today, we know that valency results from the number of electrons in an atom's outer electron shell, which can be shared with other atoms to form covalent bonds. Meanwhile, bonds formed by electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged atoms are known as ionic bonds. Of course, in Kakula's day, the existence of atoms was purely theoretical, and nothing was known of their structure. Nonetheless, the theory of valency proved extremely useful, with Kakula theorizing that all organic compounds were built on a chain or backbone of carbon atoms linked together with a single, double, or triple bond. As carbon had a valency of four, this allowed one, two, or three other atoms like hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, or chlorine to bond with each carbon atom. Another idea that Kakula incorporated into his theories was the concept of isomers, first proposed by Jacob Berzelius. Berzelius posited that the reason compounds with different properties could have the same chemical formula was that the atoms in each compound were arranged in a different geometric configuration. For example, propadine consists of a chain of three carbon atoms linked together with double bonds with two hydrogen atoms bonded to each end, while in propene, the central carbon atom is single bonded to one carbon and triple bonded to the other, with one hydrogen atom bonded to one end of the molecule and three to the other. Finally, in cyclopropene, the three carbon atoms are linked not in a straight line, but in a ring with one double and two single bonds, with two hydrogen atoms bonded to one carbon and one hydrogen to each of the other two. By combining the theory of valency with the theory of isomers, Kakula posited that chemists should be able to work out the structure of every possible organic compound. It was simply a matter of swapping out different atoms in different locations on a molecule and noting the results. These ideas laid the groundwork for the field of structural chemistry, though Kakula was not alone in this endeavor, with Scottish chemist Archibald Scott Cooper and Russian scientist Alexander Butlerov developing similar theories at around the same time. Kakula published his ideas on structural chemistry in two groundbreaking articles published in 1858, as well as his popular textbook, Le Buch de Organischen Chemie, first published in 1859. But while these works brought Kakula much acclaim, not all his ideas were warmly received. For example, Kakula developed a system for visually depicting valency and bonds between atoms in which monovalent atoms like hydrogen and chlorine were depicted as simple circles, and polyvalent atoms like carbon and nitrogen as elongated ovals with multiple lobes. Chemists ridiculed these figures as sausage formulae and instead adopted the simpler ball and stick model developed by Scottish chemist Alexander Brown. Kakula's theories allowed chemists to work out the structure of many common organic compounds, but the nature of one substance remained stubbornly elusive, benzene. Benzene has been known since the 16th century in the form of benzoic acid, produced by distilling the resin of the styrax tree and used in perfumes and topical ointments. However, it was not until 1825 that British scientist Michael Faraday first isolated pure benzene via the distillation of coal tar. By the time Kakula began his research, benzene was known to have the chemical formula C6H6. However, unlike other organic compounds chemists had studied thus far, benzene did not follow the rules dictated by Kakula's valency and carbon backbone model. Yet, compared to other known organic compounds such as methane, formula CH4, the benzene molecule was strangely stable and unsaturated, containing far fewer hydrogen atoms than expected. This meant that many of the carbon atoms in the molecule had to be linked via double bonds. However, if benzene was built around a chain of six carbon atoms, at least one bond had to be single, otherwise there would not be enough valencies left for the last two hydrogen atoms. This single bond, in turn, could exist in three different positions in the chain. Center, left, 
or right, meaning that benzene should have two different structural isomers, each with the last two hydrogen atoms bonded at different positions in the carbon chain. Yet chemists could only ever find one isomer of benzene. Furthermore, replacing one of the hydrogen atoms with another atom, for example chlorine, should have produced two possible monosubstitution isomers, one with an end hydrogen substituted and one with a central hydrogen substituted. But again, only one such isomer could be found. It was a puzzle which threatened to undermine the entire foundation of organic chemistry. It was then that Kukula had one of the most famous revelations in the history of science, arguably on par with Archimedes's alleged eureka moment or Newton's fabled apple. As he later recounted in an 1890 lecture, the events occurred in Ghent during the winter of 1861 while Kukula was working on his organic chemistry textbook. Quote, I was sitting writing at my textbook, but the work did not progress. My thoughts were elsewhere. I turned my chair towards the fire and dozed. Again, the atoms were gamboling before my eyes. This time, the smaller groups kept modestly in the background. My mental eye, rendered more acute by repeated visions of the kind, could now distinguish larger structures of manifold conformation. Long rows, sometimes more closely fitted together, all twinning and twisting in snake-like motion. But look, what was that? One of the snakes had seized hold of its own tail. As if by a flash of lightning I awoke, and this time I also spent the rest of the night in working out the consequences of the hypothesis. This was not the first time dreams had come to Kukula's aid. Allegedly, his ideas about tetravalency of carbon were inspired by a daydream about dancing molecules he had aboard a London omnibus in 1855. Based on his second, more famous dream, Kukula formed a new bold hypothesis. The benzene molecule wasn't linear, but ring-shaped, with an inner hexagonal ring of six carbon atoms linked by alternating single and double bonds and six hydrogen atoms bonded on the outside. This theory solved nearly all of the problems with the old linear model, explaining at a stroke why benzene could be so unsaturated while remaining stable, and why the molecule had only one structural and one monosubstitution isomer. As the molecule is rotationally symmetrical, all the hydrogen atoms are structurally equivalent to one another, meaning that substituting one is the same as substituting another. But despite their elegance and power, Kakula did not immediately publish his ideas. This delay was likely due to problems in Kukula's personal life. The year after his famous dream, Kukula married Stephanie Drory, daughter of an English official in the Belgium illuminating gas industry. Tragically, Stephanie died only a year later while giving birth to the couple's only son, sending Kukula into a years-long depression during which he only carried out routine teaching work. It was not until 1865 that Kukula finally resumed his research, and on May the 11th of that year, he presented his theory of the cyclical structure of benzene in a historic paper titled Some Notes on Several Substitution Products of Benzene. In the paper, he predicted that if his theory were correct, benzene should have three disubstituted isomers, that is, in which two of the hydrogen atoms are replaced, orthobenzene, in which two adjacent hydrogens are replaced, metabenzene, in which alternate hydrogens are replaced, and parabenzene, in which opposite hydrogens are replaced. Over the next few years, Kukula and his colleagues soon succeeded in isolating all three isomers, further strengthening his theory. Kukula's breakthrough revolutionized the field of organic chemistry as the vast majority of organic compounds were found to contain one or more benzene rings. Today, these are known as aromatic compounds. So influential was Kukula's discovery that in 1890, the German Chemical Society organized an elaborate celebration to mark the 25th anniversary of his landmark 1865 paper. It was during this event that Kukula first publicly recounted the story of his now famous 1861 dream about snakes biting their tails. Whether this event actually happened, or was merely a whimsical invention made after the fact, has been debated, but as a dream cannot exactly be witnessed by others, we'll never know. As a further honor, in 1995, Kukula was ennobled by Kaiser Wilhelm II as August Kukula von Stradenitz. Interestingly, this title dropped the accent from the end of Kukula's name, which has been added in 1806 to celebrate the annexation of the Grand Duchy of Hesse by Napoleon. Yet despite their outsized influence, Kukula's theories were not without their detractors. For example, in 1872, one of Kukula's students, Albert Ladenberg, pointed out that benzene should have two different ortho isomers depending on whether the two substituted hydrogen atoms were separated by a single or double carbon bond. In response, Kukula proposed a dynamic model wherein the double and single bonds in the benzene ring continually swapped places, making every position in the ring structurally equivalent. But Kukula was unable to put forward any plausible mechanism to explain this behavior, leading Lardenberg and others to develop alternative molecular structures for benzene. For example, Lardenberg's proposed structure, prismane, took the form of two rings of three carbon atoms linked together to form a triangular prism, while British chemist James Dewar's structure comprised two square rings of four carbon atoms linked together. However, both isomers were later synthesized and found to exhibit no benzene-like properties. 
Then in 1928, American chemist Linus Pauling proposed that benzene resonated between two quantum mechanical structures, producing the same effect as Kekula's dynamic model. Kekula, it turned out, had been right all along. Sadly, Kekula's professional success was not matched by his personal life. In 1867, he became a professor at the University of Bonn, where he remained for the rest of his career. Nine years later, he married his housekeeper, Louise Hogel, with which he had three more children. Unfortunately, the marriage proved an unhappy one, and Kekula's health soon began to fail. He died of influenza on July 13, 1896, aged 66. But Kekula's legacy lives on, for the aromatic compounds he helped discover form the basis of countless products which make our modern world possible, from plastics to medicines to fuels. And it all started with a dream.